This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. In 1935, director Alfred Hitchcock and star Robert Donat gave the world a goofy spy chase that brought laughs and thrills alike. In 2023, we ask the all-important question... If we didn't like the version that came from many barrels, will we like the version that comes from only one? <laughs> the film is the 39 Steps. The whiskey is 1792 single barrel. And we'll review them both. This is the, the Film, film and, and Whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at Alfred Hitchcock's 1935 British spy thriller comedy, The 39 it's, Steps. It's something, Bob. It's it's definitely something, man. <laughs> and look, not to jump in too quickly to talking about the movie itself, Brad, but one thing that blew me away watching it this time, first of all. We always say this, the sub 90 minute movie. Mm. Ugh, just mm. chef's kiss. Let's go. Brad, sometimes movies from the 1930s, I, I, if I'm going to be honest with you, I think that's like my least favorite era of movie making <gasps> because sound had just been introduced and they were really struggling with the pacing of movies for a long time there. And it's not until like the mid 30s, I feel like, that movies in general kind of found their footing again. Bob, so I am gasping in cinephile right now how <laughs> dare you speak down on the no, early there's 1930s. some notable Ugh. listen there's some notable exceptions <laughs> to the rule but in general i just find myself getting really bored with movies from the early 30s and so anytime we go back this far and i'm looking at all of our movies that we've done brad this has got to be like one of the five oldest movies we've done if you take out the chaplains like it we don't go back into the early 1930s to you know or mid 30s very often I was going to say, outside of the Chaplains, 39 is probably our earliest year. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to say, what shocked me this time is how fast this thing moves. You know, we've been looking at Hitchcock in the 1940s in America, and some of those melodramas that he made after he came over from Britain really kind of dragged and needed needed some cutting done to them. And so my worry was going even farther back into his British days, they would get even more slow. But man, it seems like before he jumped the pond, he really had something going here because this thing is cut like a Scorsese movie. Yeah, Bob, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on the pacing. For me, it had multiple parts of the film where I just kind of felt really bored. Mm. And I felt very much so like I was ready for this movie to be over. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and like, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent. 79 minute movie. Mm. Awesome. I was very excited when I saw that. Usually a good gauge for me is like when I feel the need to move the mouse a little bit, check it, pause, see how much time is left. And there's still 40 minutes left of the film <laughs> out of the 86 minute movie. Yeah. Oh, man, it just worried me a little bit. All right. Well, let me phrase <laughs> it this way, then, because I feel like you'll at least agree with this. When we think about movies that are this old, and again, you know, we haven't watched very many for the podcast, but even think about, you know, some of the other Hitchcocks we've done recently, like Notorious, mm -hmm. the length of the shots, and sometimes he's doing oneers, but even when he's not, they're just very, very long shots and setups, whereas this movie is just like, 
bang, an insert shot, bang, two people talking. Like it, it's almost like a, a really quick moving montage in points. And I'm mm-hmm. not used to seeing that kind of rapid cutting in a movie this old. Yeah. And I, I think that there are certain elements that make the movie feel more modern. One of being which what you just said. I also think some of the dialogue is way wittier than you would expect from such mm-hmm. an old film. Like there's some genuinely funny lines in this. So, yeah, I think that you can tell that this isn't just your average 1930s director figuring out sound like Hitchcock is telling a story here. And overall, he does a really good job at it. I, you know, I went to see the Taylor Swift era's tour movie over the weekend. Ooh, Bob Book the Swifty. Mm, You know it, man. And uh, so maybe (laughs) I've just got eras on the brain, but it's been kind of cool to visit early Hollywood Hitchcock. You know, we've already done late Hollywood Hitchcock, and now we're going back into pre-Hollywood Hitchcock, and they're, like, very distinct from each other. And so I'm I'm really excited to dive into this movie, Brad. It was one of two that I was kind of debating between putting on our list, the other one being a movie called The Lady Vanishes, which I found to Ooh. be way more slow-moving than this movie. So you're welcome. Oof. If Because if you <laughs> thought this one was slow, oh, buddy, The Lady Vanishes uh, does not move as briskly for me as this one does. My attention vanishes. <laughs> well, hey, we're going to get into talking about the 39 steps. But before we get there, I do just want to say we would love for you to join us on our social media platforms. You can join the conversation. You can dive in, talk about the movie that you may or may not have seen like Brad. Give us your opinions on the whiskeys we're drinking. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, at Film Whiskey. Or you can jump onto our Discord. We are on there every single day talking about movies, whiskey, and just about anything else in the world. So if you want to join the conversation, you can find a link to our Discord at the end of every single one of our show notes. All right. I said we're going to start talking about the movie. And to do that, we have to get to our first segment of the day, which we call Brad Explains. Brad's going to give us the movie plots with only 60 seconds ticking on the clock. So let's go ahead and hear your take. With this little segment that we call Brad Explains. Brad Explains is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. Brad, I'm going to go out on a pretty massive limb here and say, first time with the 39 steps? Uh, First time today, Bob. (laughs) I watch this movie every single day, get up at 4.30. Mm -hmm. I I really can't start my day without a little bit of Robert Donat. You know what I mean? What a beautiful man, by the way. Dude, the first few scenes that he is in, he's a little bit frazzled. His hair is kind of fussed up. And I was like, he kind of looks like Andrew Garfield a little bit. He has some Garfield vibes. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Uh, Anyway, Brad, you have 60 seconds on the clock. Brad Explains is where you spoil the movie uh, in graphic detail. How are you doing on the the plot mechanics here, Brad? It's kind of convoluted at points. It's a little bit obtuse <laughs> if uh, if I'm allowed to use a $10 word, Bob. Did you watch it with I, subtitles? I did not watch it with subtitles, okay, no. Yeah. See, I just kind of automatically watch things with subtitles now because it helps me understand things better. And if I'm being honest, man, uh, those Scottish accents be thick at, at mm. parts of this movie. So I double C. I thick. did not find it super hard to follow, but that's because I was like reading the script as they said the script. See, so, I... I can't get away from the fact that as I get older, I think I realize more and more how limited my attention is. And I can't get over the fact that, like, if I'm looking at the bottom of the screen and reading, I'm missing like 70% of what's going on on the screen. Wow. And I don't know if, like, other people are just better at that than me, but I have found in the past year or so that if I can not watch a movie with subtitles, I much prefer it. Mm. Sounds like a you problem, man. See, I, <laughs> you know, when uh, when Bong Joon Ho I mean, won his best director Oscar at the at the Academy Awards, he said, I, "If people can just get over the one inch obstacle at the bottom of the screen, then a whole new world of cinema will open to them." And hey, it man, sounds like you I need to get over that obstacle. Parasite. I love me some parasite. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but you weren't reading it, apparently. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but it's real pretty to look at. Hitchcock did not mean for anyone to watch this film with subtitles. So I'm going to stick with the director here 
and watched it without subs. <laughs> All right. As Hitchcock intended. Brad, you have one minute on the clock to break down this movie and go. The 39 Steps is a film about Robert Denot's character. Uh, what's his name? Harry Carey? Ah, yeah, Robert Denot. Yeah. Yeah, his character's name. Yeah, his name is Robert Denot. I don't know what his name is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. It's Hannay. 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 Yeah. Hannay. He's a guy who's Canadian and is in London. And this woman meets him at like a show hall and shoots a gun and clears everybody out. And boy, oh boy, does she st- tell him plot stuff. Mm-hmm. That there's bad people who are stealing information from the Brits. And so he goes on a wild goose chase to figure out what's going on after she's murdered. Bum, bum, he meets bum. another woman along the way who sucks, and she continually tries to give him away. There's people on his tail. He meets a professor who doesn't have a pinky. And at the end of this day, this memorization guy memorized all the details of the secret and tried to get out of the country, I think. Mm. All right, we're going to stop there. <laughs> Bob, don't, this... Don't, don't, don't overexert the, yourself The plot here, of man. this movie, if I may be so bold, sucks. Here's my counterpoint. Okay, I'm ready for no, it. No, it does not. Oh. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I never thought of it that way before. I'm going to... So this is going to be a fun episode because I'm really high on this movie. I, I loved this movie. I thought it it absolutely breezed by, you know, as I read the plot details while watching it, I thought it was really easy to understand. Here, can I can I do Bob well, explains for a second? Here's no. Here's the thing, Bob. <laughs> the plot's easy to understand. Mm-hmm. Man is framed for murder. He yep. tries to figure out the the stuff that the woman who was murdered was trying to figure out to clear his own name. Mm-hmm. Like like that's the plot. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard to figure out. It's the way they go about showing the plot and moving about the movie that. I'm like, this is just, okay, I guess stuff's just happening now. I guess we're just kind of moving along. I guess this woman just is the worst, but now she's not. None of it flowed well for me. Now, the individual scenes, some of the individual interactions between characters and things like that were incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think that Robert Denot and and Madeline Carroll have really great chemistry They have some really fun scenes together, but overall, the movie just kind of felt incredibly messy. Yeah, I'm in a completely different spot than you. And so, like I said, I think this will be a fun back and forth if you don't keep cutting me off and telling me no when I'm trying to make a point. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) besides that, yeah, you know, Brad, maybe the best way to start framing this movie is I think the kind of obvious thing. And I'm going to tip my hand with our let's make it a double here because this movie feels like the proto North by Northwest. Like it seems like oh, his yeah. his test run at North by Northwest. <laughs> 24 years <earlier. laughs> Which me which makes a lot of sense because by the time he gets to North by Northwest, not only has he improved, I think, as a director, even though this is really well directed, but he's like, I've done this exact same story before. I know where the beats need to be kind of tightened up a little bit, where there's lulls that I need to fill with something. But overall, I think the thing that impresses me the most about this movie is it's like 85 minutes long. And so there's just not a lot of downtime in between things happening. At least for me, there wasn't. It was, you know, it's very much like this. So this guy goes to a music hall, shots ring out. This woman clutches his arm, is very scared and says, can I come home with you? And Robert Donat is so good. Because he, like immediately he's like, can you come home with me? Like, I, I suppose you could come home with me. <laughs> they go back to his apartment. She spills the beans. She's like, there's two guys outside that followed me here. He's like, what's going on? She's like, I am a spy. And I have been basically outed by the counter spies who are trying to smuggle secrets out of England. They're led by a ring. She was the counter spy. They were the spies. Well, okay. Whatevs. <laughs> you know. <laughs> She's like, I need help. They're trying to smuggle secrets out of England. They are led by a guy that I'm supposed to go meet. He is missing uh, his finger below the the knuckle. That's the only way I can distinguish him. She's like, and now that I've told you all this, they're going to come for you too. And he's like, ah, psh. I think I think you misspoke. She said, 
his missing finger beneath <laughs> Pinky. Watch out for Dude, him. Dude, she's, she is such a bad actress. <laughs> and that's what set this movie off on the right path for me. Because it is, uh-huh. it is intentionally funny at parts. It is intentionally very suspenseful at parts. And then there's other parts where it's just like, who is this goofy woman that he found to play this role? So anyway, uh, she ends up with a knife in her back and Robert Donat is immediately framed for her murder and has to go on the run to try to find this guy missing a finger because he thinks the guy's going to help him. He runs through the Scottish Highlands. He finds the guy. The guy turns out to be the main bad guy. And it's revealed that the 39 Steps is this secret spy ring, kind of like Spectre in James Bond, uh, where you can't trust the cops. You can't trust anybody. He goes on the lam. He finds a doll, a dame, if you will, and uh, (laughs) she doesn't believe him for a long time, and then she does, and then they foil the plot. It's like bang, 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 bang for me, and I think that's that's what I really like about this movie is even if it didn't work as well as it did for me, and it clearly sounded like it didn't for you, Brad, I mean, you're in and out in 85 minutes. Yeah. No, I, I, once again, there are short movies that can feel long and long movies that can feel short. Like, it's more than just the actual time that is spent watching the film. And I think that's where, for me, the messiness of the movie kept it from feeling like a streamlined steam engine flying down the tracks. Hmm. Like, there's there's just so much messiness happening and so much, why, why did that happen? What's going on that forced me to, like, I don't know, just like... It forced me into a place where I was like, okay, are we really going there? Okay, sure. And it didn't allow me to just sink into the world of the movie. I think that's what I'm trying Mm. to communicate, is that there's just so much silly stuff happening that none of it facilitated my enjoyment of just falling into the film. And so because I'm thinking about it the whole time, it, it, it feels like it's taking forever. Where are you at, like, on James Bond movies in general? Or just, like, spy-type movies? Man, I have watched one or two of the older, you know, Sean Connery, Roger, Mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? Roger Moore. Roger Moore. I watched maybe, like, two or three of those when I was a kid and thought that they were silly Mm -hmm. and kind of fun as, like, an 8, 10, 12-year-old. I've never gone back and watched any of those since. So, really, my, my best exposure to the world of 007 is, you know, Daniel Craig. Right. Well, and that's, you know, it's good and it's bad because I feel like as we got into the Pierce, the post Pierce Brosnan era, there's an emphasis on these need to be much more like Jason Bourne movies, right? There is, there is Mm -hmm. no silliness inherent to the plot. Whereas that had been something that from the beginning, like James Bond characters, James Bond plots are inherently silly. Like they just are. And you have to have those moments of levity. And I feel like that's actually what made this last Daniel Craig Bond movie, for me, kind of suck, was that they tried to shoehorn in some of those things while maintaining an Mm. overly dour tone. And so anyway, I say all that to say, like, I'm wondering if some of the silliness of the plot mechanics, Brad, is, you know, how much would you put on this movie itself and how much would you put on, like, I just don't really jibe with silly spy thrillers yeah maybe i mean i I definitely grew up in an era of mission impossible Mm -hmm. jason bourne type of spy movies i think overall though the bits and pieces of this movie that i did like i like really really Mm -hmm. liked and i i think that robert denott and madeline carroll Mm -hmm. is it yep like, like I said, they have great chemistry, and I think that they both have wonderful scenes together. It was just a few moments of like, why is she at the political hall? Is that even her? Why would she be here? Mm-hmm. And then once they get into them talking, I'm like, okay, sure, there's chemistry, it works, but why is she there again? <laughs> What's going on? Like, what? It just all just, Yeah. All right, well, we're going to talk about the performances. I do want to ask like one final question on this whole topic Mm -hmm. before we get into it, Brad. And if, okay, if we take out Cary Grant as a a response, Mm -hmm. what is it about North by Northwest that works so 
almost perfectly for you. When you think about like structure, pacing, tone, that doesn't quite work for you here. Because like I said, I I think they are very similar movies. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, they're similar in like big picture idea. Like if you went and pitched this movie and pitched North by Northwest to, you know, executives, they would sound like almost the exact mm-hmm. same pitch. Mm-hmm. So I think on a broad level, looking at it, they're very similar. I think that what works in North by Northwest is just the fact that everything moves so smoothly from one place to the next. Like he he takes the time necessary to to sweep the audience along with him on the adventure whereas this one it's like it, it needed about eight extra minutes it stays a 90-ish minute movie but like eight to ten more minutes to not feel so rushed and like things are just popping up out of nowhere like everything in north by northwest makes sense on why things are happening and where things mm. are moving Especially as you get to the end of the film and, and more and more secrets are revealed. This one, it's like the, the secrets that get revealed, are you kind of feel like the cheap MacGuffins. Mm. It's like, oh, yep. I, and I guess the memory man knows it. And I, I guess she's got caught up in this and she's showing up at this political hall where he's giving a speech because he got mistaken identity all of a sudden. Like <laughs> what a great movie. I'm I like, love this movie. Man. Just... It's, it's so good. <laughs> it is funny too, Brad. You know, I, I've always talked about how unpredictable you are in terms of like when I think you'll like a movie and you don't, because there are times when like the, the logic of the movie just doesn't matter. Right? Like, you know, to mm-hmm. you and to me, like if the movie works well enough, you're like, yeah. I don't like I don't really care how he got here. I don't really care. That, like, <laughs> why is she here? Whatever. This is a fun movie. And I think for me, that's this movie. Mm-hmm. And for you, it is some other movie that is not this one. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100 percent. And I, I think that part of it is also like the fact that this is Hitchcock. Mm. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, you expect more out of the great directors of all time. And for me, I was just like, oh, I expected more than this oh, wow. from Hitchcock. And it it didn't deliver. And that's okay. Like, he doesn't have to deliver on every single movie he makes. Like you said, by the time he made Notorious, he'd already made like 30 films, which means that here in 1935, he's probably already made like 15. So when I when I think about just who Hitchcock is... I think I just expected more polish. Mm. All right. Well, man, I feel like I have given you the floor too much to to denigrate this movie. And listeners are probably dropping like flies at this point because it's only when both of us are very enthusiastic about a movie that I feel like we actually inspire people to go see the movie. So uh, mm. I, we've pretty much taken care of that at this point. No one will go watch 39 Steps, even though I am going to give it a very high score. And I think it works like gangbusters. Uh, I need to salvage this a little bit, Brad. Let's bring this back around. And I think we can do that by talking quickly about these two main performers, Robert Donat and Madeline Carroll. And let's start Let's start with Robert Donat, because I think all we've said about him so far is he is very beautiful and he reminds us of Andrew Garfield. Uh, <laughs> and I think what I'll say is it doesn't feel like a 1935 hammy stagey performance to me like it feels very Mm -hmm. lived in not quite like a like a uh, naturalistic performance but definitely ahead of its time I think and I was just really really pleasantly surprised at how he finds the perfect amount of being bemused by the whole thing like he never stops being (laughs) horny he's always trying to like sleep with somebody You know, he kisses that one guy's wife on the mouth when she helps him out. And that one's not like sexual. It's more just thank you very much. And I know that your husband sucks, but like you're never going to get a kiss like this again, baby, baby, (laughs) Then walk out the door. (laughs) But like, you know, with Cary Grant in North by Northwest, Cary Grant had achieved a very particular kind of bemusement, too. And at that point, it was the bemusement of like a guy who is older, like. No, I'm not going to run. I can't run anymore. I have bad knees, but I am going to sit here and crack jokes about this. And Robert Donat is a much different, like he's much younger. He's much more athletic. He can run up and down the Scottish Highlands, chasing, getting chased by these guys. But he never stops having a sense of wit about it. And I think he plays it absolutely perfectly. 
Yeah, I think that Donat has a natural charm and charisma that lets him be more casual with with his acting compared to, uh, like you said, a more hammy, chewing the scenery type of performance. Mm -hmm. I think that what really helps him the most is the fact that Hitchcock keeps him moving and keeps him on his toes as a character. The, I, I don't know. Am I allowed to say bad things about it, Bob, or is my statue? Is <laughs> you can say bad things. That's fine. That. It's fine. Okay. Okay. I'll just I'll just go back to the messiness of the film. There's just certain points, specifically the political speech that he gives, where I'm like, where did this come from, character wise? Hmm. Like all of a sudden he's giving this political speech that you're like, is Hitchcock is preaching at us? Is there something going on here? Because it doesn't feel like it fits with the rest of the film. And so I think moments like that, like he does an incredible job there as an actor, but I think the character suffers because of what's going on in the script. And I I, I think I can separate those things in my mind and be like, yeah, I don't know why the hell Hitchcock asked him to do that, but he did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> All right. On the other side, you've got Madeline Carroll. And I will say this, Brad, I think that the movie takes a pretty drastic shift at the one hour ish mark. So he has been being chased solo until he gets handcuffed to her in the back of a police wagon by two guys who aren't actually policemen. You, you come to kind of figure out who they really are, but they get handcuffed together and make their escape and hijinks ensue. And there is some comedy involved and, you know, they have to pretend like they're a married couple and they're hiding their hands and he's pretending to threaten her with a gun because she thinks that he's a murderer and like, there's a lot of convoluted comedy there. But I also like this is where I started to feel like, oh, OK, this is the biggest lull in the movie for me. Like, I'd rather I really want to get back to this guy being chased. And I know that they're trying to set up like romantic tension and character development here. But when they go to that inn, and, you know, the old Scottish woman is thinks that they're a married couple and the whole <laughs> everything that unfolds throughout that night. It takes a long time to get through. Now, I will say, sure it does. I will say it's it's at like the one hour mark and the movie ends at like the hour twenty five mark. So like it's probably only about 10, 12 minutes of screen time before you're back into it again for the finale of the movie. But I, I don't want to penalize Madeline Carroll for this, because, again, I think it's it's a victim of like the plot mechanics and the script. But I think her character to me kind of represents the parts of this movie that I don't care for, because every time they're trying to develop her, the movie slows down. Yeah, to do it, it. it grinds to a halt. I think is the phrase you were mm -hmm. looking for. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and the thing is that like the scene in the Scottish Inn has really funny moments. It's got some meaningful character development, but it does feel like it takes up like three quarters of this movie, even though it's maybe like ten percent. And you right. then get to the theater at the end. And all of a sudden, the movie's over. And it, it, it felt mm. jarring to go from, like, let's slow down, and they're spending the night together, at this madcap chase is finally crying, ground to a halt, and then all of a sudden, we're at the theater, and it's the memory man, and he confessed. Also, why did the memory man answer the question? You know, it's funny. Like, I, I don't know if it's if it's implied that, like, he, he has to. Like he, like, he has some sort of, like... He's on the spectrum or he has like Asperger's, or yeah. you know what I mean? But like it feels very much like all he does is compute things and then spits them out. Right. So I, I don't know. Uh, I think it's because the movie needed to happen. D yeah. <laughs> the answer you always want to hear when asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> all right, man. Well, it's very obvious to me that we're in different places on this movie. I'm still enjoying myself because this movie was a freaking blast and uh, like the best way I could have spent 86 minutes last night. But I'll say I'll say something I like about it. Go for it. The scene on the on the train mm. was incredible. Mm -hmm. Like it felt like a really early version of high and low. Mm. Like they're, they're on the train. The camera's moving with them. Obviously, it's 1935, so the camera's not dollying through the hallway with them. But there is a really cool thrill of that scene for me. That little scene, that little 10, 15-minute scene was like the best part of the movie for me. 
Well, now I'm really second guessing myself because the movie that I could have chosen over this, The Lady Vanishes, is entirely set on a train. So, oh, I, I had no I, idea that you were I, such a train, a train movie, movie fan. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, let's uh, let's carry these split feelings into the whiskey for the day and see if we can find some consensus. What do you say? Let's get to it. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. All right, so today we are checking out 1792 Single Barrel. Brad, we are on a losing streak here with this brand. I don't really know how else to... Let's not beat around the bush here. Yeah, I unfortunately, the 1792 products so far have been billed as... Like, really solid, affordable, you know, $30-ish whiskeys. I have not experienced that, to be <laughs> blunt. The affordability or the solid part? Uh, the affordability, Bob, is incredible. I did not pay any money for this whiskey. There you go. So, <laughs> free, free whiskey big, is always the most affordable kind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I was much higher than you on the small batch, and I think part of that is that I was just drinking out of my own bottle and maybe trying to yeah. justify the purchase. But uh, I'm with you on the sweet wheat <laughs> and the high rye. And today we have a sample that has been sitting on our shelf for probably far too long uh, from the Instagram account and friend of the podcast, Bourbon and Stuff. This is the mm. 1792 single barrel. And the thing about this barrel, Brad, is I have seen a picture of the actual bottle this came from, and there is there is like no indicators on the bottle itself. Like, I really have yeah. no idea what the barrel number is, what the age of this is. It's just, I mean, it looks like your standard 1792 bottle. It just says single barrel. Do you know the proof? Yeah, Brad. So this is not a barrel proof version of the product. It's been watered down to 98.6 proof or 49.3 ABV. And just a reminder to all of our fans out there who might not you know, know all the ins and outs of whiskey. Watered down is not a bad term in the whiskey world. <laughs> I should have said diluted. I know. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, quite literally, down... it has been watered down to a certain yes. proof point. Yeah. 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 Just just so everybody knows, watered down has a negative connotation in most contexts. However, here for the whiskey world, it literally just means they added some water to it to make it more uh, a little softer. Hmm. Well, it takes takes the edge off, Bob. There you go. Gentle on the old palate. Mm. Brad, I will let you start us off today. We've both tried this product and we have come prepared with notes. What did you pick up on the nose of this one? Dude, I was a very big fan of the nose here. Wow. Which was a, a great, great surprise as, as compared <laughs> to the last three weeks. Uh, I got some bubble gum. There's caramel and vanilla. And I, I got like my, my daughter is a huge fan of anything that is like birthday cake birthday cake flavored mm -hmm. uh, and you know as a two-year-old that can be expected this was like a birthday cake uh timkin or timbit or whatever they're called like a, like the donut holes oh yeah yeah you know what i'm talking about like yep. a timbit that's like the birthday cake flavored it's got the spark the sprinkles in it that is what this smelled like to me it's rich delectable i give it an eight out of ten on the nose yeah, man, I wish that mine had opened up as much as yours did. This for me was kind of all oak. And for the first time, maybe ever on a bourbon, I got something that I sometimes get on scotch, which is like a, a very saline, heavy, kind of meaty scent, like salted meats. I got on this a little bit and that Ooh. threw me off. After about a minute or two, it kind of opened up into your more standard bourbon notes. I got a lot of vanilla on this, but even then, it was overpowered by how oaky it was on the nose. So I'm going to give it just a six here and uh, and hope that it gets better. Yeah. So on the palate for me, the vanilla really powered through strong like it did for you on the nose. I, I almost called it like a vanilla extract. Like mm -hmm. you just open the bottle and give it a little 
puff into your nose. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some almond nuttiness here. The caramel comes through, and the cakiness stayed, but it wasn't. It didn't smell like cake anymore. To me, it smelled like a jar of cheap white frosting, mm. like sugary and delicious. Mm. <laughs> and your score? Oh, and I gave it a seven point five. Not quite as compelling as the nose was. But like a really solid above average palette. I'm a big fan of the palette on this one, uh, mostly because of like the progression of how things happen. Like it was it was surprise after surprise for me. So it opened with a lot of really strong vanilla and caramel sweetness on the tip of my tongue. Like it was very sugary sweet. And then as it kind of like moved back on my palate, there was a nice heat. This is definitely like the hottest tasting one we've had so far, even though it's still under 100 proof. When I went to swallow, everything just kind of opened up and it was just like an explosion of cinnamon, almost like cinnamon red hot candy uh, and oak. But they went together so well that I felt like it it really gave this whiskey a backbone that the others before this have been missing. And it and it wasn't over oaked. And that was, I think, the most surprising yeah. thing to me. So, yeah, seven and a half on the palate for me. And then the finish was kind of more of the same. It It built both in ethanol and in flavor. Like this definitely had the most aggressive finish of the four for me so far. But again, it was backed up by just a ton of that cinnamon flavor. I gave it an eight on the finish. Yeah, I think the finish was a similar level of the palette for me. I'll give it a seven and a half there. There's oak, there's vanilla. And I got like, like we talk about weeded whiskeys having like a cherry flavor to it. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think that this is that level of cherry. For me, it's more of like a maraschino cherry uh, vibe on the finish. That, that was <laughs> a pleasant. vibe. It's the LaCroix yeah. of cherries. It's just like, hey, remember <laughs> yes. cherries? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good way of, uh, of describing it, Bob. Uh, I think the balance here is like there's nothing complex about this whiskey, but it's pretty solid all around. Uh, I, I'd give it a seven out of ten. Yeah, I'm with you. The only notes that I really took on this were builds nicely. Period. Yeah. Seven point five, and it does. It yeah. it progressively gets more complex and more interesting as it goes along. And so it's not perfectly interesting across the board, but I'd rather have it go up than go down throughout the experience. So it's a seven point five yeah. for me. Yeah, and I I think that when it comes to value, it seems like single barrels of the 1792 variety go for around $70. That that was kind of the best that I could see online. Um, I don't know about you, Bob. This is not like the greatest single barrel that I've ever had by, by a stretch, but it was pretty solid. Uh, Brad, I hate to kind of poke holes in your theory here, but I am on the Ohio Liquor website. And in the state of Ohio, this is sold for $39.99. So it is an allocated bourbon. I think it only drops once a year. And so you have to enter the bottle lottery for it. But the $70 you're seeing, I think, is a secondary price. So MSRP is is what most people are going to get it at. For sure. For sure. MSRP is 40 bucks. I think maybe let's split the difference. Let's call it like 55. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. At $55, I don't think this is a bad value. I definitely... So I scored it at a 7.5 out of 10 on value at the MSRP. At 55, mm-hmm. it would be lower than that. I think I'd probably only give it a 6 out of 10. I I was literally thinking, thinking the same thing. I think if this is in the 55, you know, 50 to 60 range, it's decent value. It's a bottle that I'd be intrigued by. Um, but it's not something that I would necessarily go out and say, I have to have some of this. Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, six, six out of six out of 10 for me. Well, and with that one and a half point deduction for my value score, I'm coming out to a 35 out of 50. Brad, what are you at? I'm a point above you. 36. All right. So we are at a 35.5 out of 50 or a 71 out of 100. This is kind of nice because 35 is generally where we start recommending a product. And I think this is right there. Like if Mm -hmm. ever anything was on the cusp for me anyway, it was this product. And I think the score perfectly reflects that. I don't know that I would necessarily buy a bottle of this, but I think I would definitely recommend trying a pour. Yeah, I would say split a bottle, buy a pour, 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily commit to a bottle right off the bat. Hmm. <laughs> what do you mean right off the bat? Like maybe it'll grow on you and then you want to buy a bottle? Well, yeah, like, you know, like the first thing I'm going to do with 1792 single barrel, buy an entire bottle. Oh, that's I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going I'm to give it a little, you know, give it a little dry run first. I like it. All right. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes with our movie for the day because we've already been saying that this movie felt like a dry run for North by Northwest. It sure did. So what do you say we get back into talking about the 39 steps? Let's get to it, Bob. All right, everybody, that was 1792 Single Barrel, a whiskey that I can't really think of much more to say about, Bob. No. It was it was there. It was solid. Very and pleasant I, I whiskey. And, and I'll by, say this. Go ahead. A whiskey that has outshone its previous <laughs> entries. I was going to say, by comparison, <laughs> this this is stellar. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, I, this has redeemed the 1792 brand for me just a little bit. But only this one barrel that we've tried. Yeah, I yeah. Who knows? All the other barrels might be just complete. I'll, shite. I'll let down. <laughs> All right, man. Well, we have uh, we've been kicking the can down the road a little too long here. I want to see if I can get above five hundred uh, guaranteed on the year. Well, and the other thing is, we know for a fact that this is Robert Donut's favorite segment of our show. <laughs> I like that you call him Donut. Robert, <laughs> Robert Donut. Donut. <laughs> donut. His donut. middle name is Hertz. Don't at. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's get into our segment, Two Facts and a Falsehood. Brad is going to try to stump you, Bob. Two are right and one is wrong. Two facts and a falsehood. Two facts and a falsehood is the part of the podcast where Brad presents three items to me as fact about the making of this movie, one of which is a complete lie, and it's my job to determine which that is. Brad? I'm sitting at, what, uh, 15 and 13 right now on the season. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. I'm sitting at 16 and 14 on the season right now. You sure are. It is. Uh, it's up to you, man. We'll see what no. you do. I'm guaranteed to split with you, but you could secure a loss for yourself today if you're not careful. Uh, that's an interesting way of phrasing that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you could you is, could clinch a losing season. I could. That that's true. I'm I I am familiar with that place, Bob. Mm. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> As fans of Cleveland sports, we I know exactly where I'm at right now. <laughs> the magic number is always constantly hanging over our heads come the I'm end at of the baseball point season. Where I was going to say I'm at the point where we can't consider the season an entire loss but I'm definitely not getting a good enough draft pick to change next year. Mm -hmm. I, I know I'm quite familiar. <laughs> All right, man, hit me with your two facts and a falsehood. Fact number one, before filming the scene where Hannah and Pamela run through the countryside, Alfred Hitchcock handcuffed them together and pretended for several hours to have lost the key in order to put them in the right frame of mind for such a situation. Hmm. Fact number two, Robert, uh, see, now you've got me in my head. Daunt, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> I think he just said it, Danat. Danat. Fact number two, Robert Danat suffered from frequent sinus infections and was forced to put push back his speech scene many times due to his nasally sound and lack of vocal power. Hmm. Fact number three, the 62 imported sheep upon arriving at the soundstage, immediately started eating the bushes that had been brought with them. The infuriated crew had to replace the plants with ones hastily bought from a local nursery. Okay. I have no idea. I'm, I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. You have leaned so far into the, like, let, let's get the most boring sounding ones mm -hmm. that I kind of don't even care what the falsehood is at this point. Like, none of these facts are even that cool to me. You picked the well, lame ones, man. Thank you, Bob. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Good thing. I'm not worried about what you think I of the, lame, the lameness or awesomeness of my facts. Oh, believe me. I am aware that you don't I'm care what I think. I'm simply concerned with, <laughs> with winning. I think number two sounds kind of true. And I could see him being sick through the production. It seemed like a very intense and grueling production at parts. Number three also sounds pretty funny. That sounds like something that could have happened. 
I oh, no 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 Bob, it's not funny. It's it's boring and droll and I mean, you know, just a silly fact. It's like if you were at a party and you're trading stories with somebody, it's like the seventh story <laughs> you would share. You're like, oh yeah, one time I was on a movie and the sheep ate all the bushes. It's you know, cool. <laughs> It's not unfunny. It's just, you know, you don't lead with that one. (laughs) Number one is the one that I'm kind of gravitating toward as a possible falsehood. I know Hitchcock had a playful side. I it's hard for me to think that he would delay production for hours and hours, like just to get them in the right frame of mind. But who knows? Maybe he did. Uh, But just to, you know, not delay the inevitable here. (laughs) I'm going to just go ahead and say number one is the falsehood, and that's my final answer. Bob, my 500 season is still in the running. Hey! You are, cor- you are incorrect. You almost, you almost contradicted yourself there. I know. I almost said correct. You are incorrect, Bob. You suck at this game. True. Truly. True. I mean, when we first implemented this game, I dominated that season, whatever it was, <laughs> and you have very rapidly uh, met me on the talent level here, Brad. I've come a long way. Uh, okay, so what was the falsehood? Uh, fact number two was the falsehood. And the sinuses, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Completely false. <laughs> wow. But the sheep, the sheep, the sheep is man. a true story. See, Let's... listen, you, you gave me crap when I said that it was like the seventh <laughs> story you share at a party, but it was the third <laughs> fact you shared. Like, it wasn't even it was. good enough for you to share first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a great fact, man. All right, man. Let's get back into talking about this movie a little bit. And, you know, I guess I just kind of have one remaining question for you, Brad. Um, it doesn't sound like you're totally negative on this film. And yet, yeah, the first half of this episode would indicate otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Two out of ten. We've seen enough Alfred Hitchcock movies now that I think whatever the word Hitchcockian might mean to you, you probably have a good sense of what that is now. What a word. <laughs> what a great word. You know, like, I just, I want to be famous enough someday that, like, bookian is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Bookish. G-esque. Uh, a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, G-esque. I like that one. Okay. So, I'm going to ask you, is this movie quote-unquote Hitchcockian to you, and what does that term mean to you at this point? Like, what is the hallmarks of a of an oh, Alfred Hitchcock man. movie? Oh, see, I, I feel like I'm, I'd have to think about that more to come up with something that's not, you know, kind of trite. Mm-hmm. Like, at the end of the day, there's women in the movie that show their legs. Like, You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he has a very clear shot of her, like, taking her stockings off. Mm-hmm. And, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so even in the 30s, Hitchcock was a horny dude. Very much so. Yep. Uh, you know, there's the, the classic blonde, there's the mystery thriller twist and turn. Um, I don't know if I would say I would, I would consider Hitchcock a big reveal guy. You know what I mean? Like a Shyamalan. Sure. There's the twist. But this one has that. And I, I think I, I enjoyed that element of it. I think that's the cinematography of the film, the way he shot the movie. I think that he does a really great job of using lots and lots of either close up shots or like really wide, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, the knot is like a s- tiny speck on a on a ridge line. That was such a good meadow. shot, man. Such a good shot. Because there's guys in the foreground going, there he is and pointing yep. Oh, it's yep. so good. And they're like the way they're they're um oh, what's the word? Like highlighted by the the light of mm-hmm. the sky and it's just so good. Yeah. So I think that like if I'm to point to any cinematography, it's the fact that he he is great. He has just really brilliant anxious close-ups mm-hmm. and really beautiful wide establishing shots. Mm-hmm. And I, I think he kind of lives in those two realms a lot in his movies. So, yeah, I, I would call this Hitchcockian. Yeah, for me, I think, you know, I was actually just watching a Hitchcock movie last night that I'd never seen before. And it was, uh, spoiler alert, not one of his best. And <laughs> and it's partially because it didn't do the things that I associate with the really good Hitchcock movies. And it's everything you've said. But for me, it's also uh, it's the sense of pacing and it's knowing like when to stop the jokes and when to just completely tip into the thrills. Even North by Northwest as like as 
cool and tongue in cheek as that movie is, and it's always kind of winking and it's a little bit wry, you know, when when they're getting chased across the the rush Mount Rushmore at the end of the movie, like mm. we're not cracking jokes at that moment. You know what I mean? It's no. it's suspenseful enough that he knows when to stop doing that. So it's that, and then it, it's coupled with the sort of playfulness that Hitchcock has, whether it is like what you were talking about, like the hints at sex and, you know, implicating the audience and being horny and voyeurs just like he is, <laughs> you know, like the, the whole movie of Rear Window is you like doing this and you can't explain mm-hmm. why, but we're all watching this guy across the way. And Bob, I was on Amazon the other day. And there is a rear window board game. Oh, yeah. I was, I like was looking through board game sales and I was like, why is there an Alfred Hitchcock presents rear window colon the board game? You get you get the game and it's just a box with binoculars <laughs> and you, you're just asked to spy on your own neighbors. <laughs> that's incredible that's, that's oh, funny <laughs> man. but yeah i think by all the criteria that we've we've set forth here i do think this movie is hitchcockian i think it's playful i think it's got a sense of humor it really ratchets up the tension for me in those those final moments i think the chase element is really reminiscent of what he does later on with north by northwest so yeah like it might not be a pure exercise in suspense or horror but it's definitely got all the hallmarks of a really good Hitchcock movie. Do you think that we should come up with like a rating scale for how much a movie is like a Hitchcock film? Like if it's an eight to ten, like a Hitchcock film, it's Hitchcockian. Mm. You know, six to eight is Hitchcock esque. There's a whole thing we could do here. Four, four to five is just Hitchcock adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> OJ Hitchcock, <laughs> the Lacroix of Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I think it is time for us to get to our final segment of the day, which we call Let's Make It a Double. We're near the end of the episode, so thanks for listening to the Film and Whiskey Show. Let's pair another film with this one, even if it's struggling. It's the final segment of the day, now let's make it a double. Let's Make It a Double is the part of the show where we pick a movie to pair up with this one to make the perfect double feature. Brad, I'm going to be very boring and very brief here. I, I think the very obvious choice is North by Northwest. Not, not just because it is a chase movie, but it is an Alfred Hitchcock chase movie. It's got, you know, it's got the blonde. It's got everything you could want in a Hitchcock movie. Uh, there's a couple other kind of chase oriented movies that he made throughout his career. There's a good one called Saboteur. Uh, but guess what? It's not as good as North by Northwest. So you should go watch North by Northwest alongside the 39 steps and have just a really fun night at the movies. Yeah, I was going to say, don't let my booing dissuade anyone from watching North by Northwest. It's an incredible film. My booing is just that Bob is boring and basic. Oh, yeah. I am going to pick a movie that is nowhere near as good as North by Northwest. <laughs> well, let's be let's be very clear. <laughs> Important caveat. Important caveat. Honestly, I think that the film I'm going to pick is actually a really good modern example of the level of filmmaking that I think 39 Steps is at. Uh, It's a movie that's not great, but I had a lot of fun with the first time I watched it. I'm going with my boy Tommy Cruise, Mm. Night and Day. I have never seen that movie. You've never seen Night and Day? No, because it was one of those ones that when it came out, all the reviews were like two and a half stars out of four. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, it it wasn't, like, enough to get me to actually pick it up at Blockbuster or whatever. And and Bob, they were all right. (laughs) Like, like, like it's cesy. It's funny. There's there's some really good moments. I, I think what makes that movie work for me is that you can tell it's Tom Cruise making a movie that's kind of making fun of the Mission Impossible movies. Mm-hmm. Like like if you read a layer deep, and that's just amusing to me because Tom takes it so seriously, but he's also like joking about it throughout. I, It's a fun movie. It, it, I would put it along the lines of like a Jack Reacher type of Tom Cruise movie. Got it, yep. You know, it, it's fun, it's good, it's him doing his thing, but in a different universe. Uh, Cameron Diaz is, is pretty funny in it. She's, she's all right. She's not my favorite actress, Mm. but I think that story wise and just 
production value wise, I'm like, yeah, go watch Night and Day. That'd be a fun watch with uh, with the 39 steps. I love a good two and a half star movie sometimes because it's like mm-hmm. it's not bad. And I wouldn't yeah. even call it like mediocre because mediocre to me is like I can't tell if I want my time back or not. Like it is so perfectly yeah. in the middle, you know, and two mm-hmm. and a half is like, all right, that was a severely flawed movie. And I still don't feel like I wasted that time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those films that if it if it was like, uh, what's it? If it was like Jeremy Renner in the lead instead of Tom Cruise, it would be like a four point nine on IMDb. But because <laughs> Tom is so charismatic, uh, I just looked. It's a six point three on IMDb. That's that's a perfect two and, and a half star movie. Yeah, man. and it's because Tom is just freaking Tom Cruise. All right, so there you go. We've got a 10 out of 10 movie in North by Northwest and a 6.3 out of 10 movie (laughs) in Night and Day. Brad, hopefully this movie, The 39 Steps, is a little bit higher than 6.3 in your estimation. Uh, I'm really interested to hear where you fell out on where you fell out, where you fell on this one, because it seemed negative at first and now it seems pretty positive. So do you want to hold your cards back a little bit or do you want to spoil it now? Uh, I'll let you go first, Bob. I'm going to give it a nine out of 10. The first time I saw it, I was like, wow, this might be Hitchcock's earliest 10. This movie works like gangbusters. And this time around, like it has its flaws. And I think part of the flaws are just, frankly, it is 90 years old almost. Mm -hmm. And as fast as it moves for a, for a movie from 1935, it is still a movie from 1935. And there are just some editing techniques and uh, things that we've developed that help move films along a little better than this. I think that there are some flaws in the script. There are some some huge leaps in logic. You kind of just have to accept where it's going. But ultimately, I had a freaking blast watching this movie, and it's a 9 out of 10 for me. Yeah, I, I thought that this was a perfect, since we already sent the time establishing what this is, it's a perfect two and a half movie. Like, I, I, come on. I'm going to I'm going to be at a seven point five. That's a three out of four. <laughs> uh, fine. That's I'm, not a, se- that's I'm not at a seven. I'm at a seven out of ten. Uh, did I just convince you to lower your score just based on you that? You 100 percented. Wow. Snark, snark does not get you anywhere, my friend. <laughs> I was wavering between a seven and a seven and a half and you pushed me down. Yep. This is a seven out of ten movie. It's solid. It, it's fine. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, the fact that it was an hour and twenty six minutes is very helpful. Uh, it's it's a fun one. Go yeah. like go watch it on IMDb. It's got a seven point six. Honestly, any movie that is almost ninety years old and has a seven point six, I feel like is a pretty damn good movie. Like the fact that people watch this movie in twenty twenty three, knowing the distance <laughs> that we are from yeah. the time this movie was released and then still, still give it like a seven, eight, yeah. maybe a nine. Like I that, mean, I yeah, think that's, that's pretty a impressive. pretty strong endorsement for this film. So we're coming out to an eight out of 10, which is pretty well in line with the 7.6 on IMDb. But I'd like to know what you think. Have you seen the 39 steps? Has, uh, have you persevered throughout Brad's complaints? And have we convinced you to go watch it now? You can let us know on all of our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube at Film Whiskey. Or if you really love what we are doing here, if you've been a fan of the podcast for a while or you've listened to this episode and you're like, man, movie from 1935, I'm convinced. You can give money to our podcast. This is not free to do. We do it out of the love of our hearts for you guys and the fact that we love, you know, watching movies and drinking whiskey. But if you wanted to, there's three Patreon tiers. There's $3 a month, $5 a month, $7 a month, all of which gets you a bevy of extra bonus content and more access to us, Bob and Brad, the guys you want to hang out with. So get on there. Go to patreon.com slash film whiskey. Man, when you started the pitch for the Patreon and you were like, you can give us money. I was like, oh, this is not going to be effective. But then you used the word bevy and you completely redeemed yourself, Brad. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It's a (laughs) dumb and dumber moment if I've ever seen it. All right. Next week, we are rounding out season seven, our 32nd movie of the year. We're going to be joined by film critic Daniel Zwayo to talk about one of Hitchcock's best the 1950s suspense classic Dial M for Murder. 
So we'll see you next week for that. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.